Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Bush. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Demand Driven Technologies and delighted to be hosting our webinar today about building agility in the food and beverage industry supply chain. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes before we dive into our content. Uh, everyone will be in a listen only mode. We do that to protect the audio, audio quality for all the participants and we have a very large number today. Uh, so we would appreciate if you do have questions and we're very interested in addressing any questions you may have. You'll see in your Zoom control panel, a Q&A uh, button. And if you use that and post your questions there during the session, we'll cover those off before the end of the session. We will be distributing uh, a link to the recording of the webinar, as well as a, a small presentation that we'll be including in the second half of the session as well. And then finally, we'll held, held, have a little highlight of a follow-on event that we're going to be holding two weeks from today to kind of extend the content of this session into some of the practical application uh, principles and concepts that would revolve around applying demand-driven MRP and demand-driven concepts into a food and beverage uh, client environment. So with that, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Barry Anderson, a colleague that I've had the great privilege of working with uh, at Coca-Cola Beverages of Africa for the last four to five years. Barry's been gracious enough to join us today. Uh, Barry, how are you doing today? Hi, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. <laughs> um, hi, Eric, yes, I'm all well. Um, I'm speaking to you from Nairobi, Kenya, and uh, yeah, excited to be here. No, awesome, awesome. So from an agenda standpoint, what we're going to be doing is I wanted to set the context. And there's a number of interesting themes and questions that kind of center around the food and beverage industry. And instead of doing a presentation, what I thought we'd do with Barry is just kind of use this as a little bit of an interview or a question and answer kind of period to talk about some of the competitive pressures, some of the themes, and other elements that affect the food and beverage industry from a supply chain standpoint. We'll follow that up with a series of illustrations that I'll share with all of you of how you kind of connect things like skew proliferation and other uh, realities that supply chain folks in the F&B space are dealing with into some of the tactics that we'll get to in our next webinar. So Barry, uh, thanks so much for your time today. Uh, really have enjoyed working with you over the years. Uh, why don't you share for our audience a little bit of your background and how you came to work for CCBA and your role in the company? Thanks, Eric. Yes. Um, well, I've been with CCBA for many years, 28 years to be exact. So yes, there's, there's, a, there's a very faint recollection of a life before Coke. <laughs> so yes. Uh, um, and over the years, obviously, a 28-year career, I've, uh, I've covered in many different roles in many different functions. But basically, the last 15-odd years, it's been specifically focused around the planning function. So it's all about how do we implement robust, robust routines and processes and ensuring that the teams are in place. So my role is then specifically into the, the greater Africa, so in within our footprint, so within the CCPA Coca-Cola Beverages Africa footprint, I'm responsible for the countries pretty much outside of South Africa mm -hmm. and just ensuring that we have the routines and processes in place. So I work very closely with the, with the planning teams on the ground and obviously with, uh, with your software tool as our enabler. Awesome, awesome. So if you kind of step back from that and, and just reflect on the roles, and the changes that you've seen in the environment during your career, um, what would be kind of the, the key challenges that you've seen and are, are working through that you could share and kind of as setting the wider context for what the market and the, uh, the competitive situation is like? Yes, uh, and I, I see, I think it, it's, you, you'll see it everywhere. I mean, it's, it's just a proliferation of players in the market. There's... 30 years ago, 30, almost 30 years ago, when I started, it was Coke and Pepsi. That was it. Those were the players in the beverage industry. And now there's house brands. There are no-name brands. There are small little niche brands. There are local brands. There are a pr proliferation of new players in the market. And mm -hmm. each one of them just bring a niche product or they bring a new flavor or a new pack and they just broaden the, the, the horizon for the consumer. And what we've seen as well is consumer preference. So as there's more available, the consumers are becoming more demanding. They want more choice. Uh, 
So these are kind of the things that have kind of defined our industry, a lot of growth. And then so how that, is, what, sorry, how has Coke tried to respond? I mean, does, as these new entrants come in, you know, one to me obvious category that sprung up over the last several years was like the uh, energy drinks and the like. <clears throat> does that spur more product innovation on your side? I mean, kind of, are there, are there responses um, that you as a CCBA business engage in as a result of this new competition? Yes, absolutely. So to your point, the energy business, I mean, Red Bull being the, the market leader in that field, a big player. So what is the Coca-Cola company? And I mean, we as a bottler don't do product innovation per se. So that comes from the Coca-Cola company. Um, so yes, there's been a lot of product innovation and also a lot of joint ventures. So we are in joint venture with uh, the Monster company. So we mm. manufacture and distribute the Monster products. And then we have a couple of local Coke brand energy products, Power Play, Play, Predator. There's all a host of them. So yes, <laughs> definitely. As 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 the market expands and as the opportunities, we we try to, in the non-alcoholic ready to drink sector we try to play in most of those segments yes i see i see um what other challenges has that increased competition um well, generated for you try and forecast all of that that is probably <laughs> the single biggest challenge mm -hmm. um that as i mean you you got brand coke which is has been around for 100 plus years it kind of just ticks over it's easy mm -hmm. you can get a forecast accuracy of the high 90s without breaking a sweat. But then you've got 120 other SKUs that aren't brand Coke, that are the energy drinks and the water and the juices and the sports drinks and the teas and the coffees and everything that goes with it. And these very small segmented SKUs become extremely difficult to forecast. Mm -hmm. And with that, obviously, the issues that go with forecasting and traditional MRP, which is very much forecast driven, you, you get the results be, which are kind of reflective of the poor forecast. Yeah. And then, yeah, sorry. You're saying? No, go ahead. Yeah. And then just, you asked as well, what are the kind of challenges that we're facing? And, and just within our businesses and specifically now during and post COVID is, staff turnover, just having yeah. regular people in place, doing the job, understanding, knowing the business. So we constantly have new people are coming on board, learning the business, learning what it's about. And that in itself is being a challenge from a planning perspective from what I'm talking yeah. from. So. Yeah. Very, very interesting. So if you think about the competitive pressure, new entrants, it's kind of interesting that I guess, you know, I would think that there was, with the established brands, you've got a heavy presence, you've got, you know, um, a footprint within the retail channels and, and the distribution market uh, that they're able to make those inroads. But but it kind of seems to connect to the fact that the buyer, the market, um, are looking for new products or interested in new offerings of new flavors or whatever. Um, how, how do you see that? Is there shifts in what the market's looking for? Do you see changes there that uh, are affecting this story? Yes, as I said earlier, the, the consumers becoming a lot more demanding, uh, insisting on a lot more choice in flavor range, in package range. In, mm -hmm. So for every occasion, they want a different pack or a different option or solution. And you, you mentioned the, the proliferation of these new players in the market. And what's happened with it, 30 years ago, we were pre predominantly a glass, returnable glass business. Mm -hmm. very high barrier to entry because yep. the investment in the glass was, is extreme. It's a lot of money. It's the, the reverse logistics. It's getting product out there, getting those empties, those glass and crates back. The equipment was very specific. You had the washers yeah. and everything that went with it. As it's evolved, as technology has changed, it's become more, a lot more one-way packaging. So it's a lot more cans mm -hmm. and PET, plastic. And there the barrier of entry is very low. So the technology yeah. is advanced. The technology has actually become cheaper. So putting a line in place, it's, it's become a relatively cheap exercise. So we've got a lot more entrants playing in the market with, and then mm -hmm. you've got these flavor houses that 
basically all they do is they make concentrates. And so it's pretty easy. You go it's yeah, like yeah. shopping off the shelf. You say, okay, I want this flavor and this flavor and this flavor. You buy it, you mix it, you package it, you do a bit of marketing behind it and off you go. So it's becoming Very really easy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, it's interesting too, because we've seen <clears throat> in other clients that there's been uh, a shift towards more health consciousness. You know, people are interested in, um, you know, different sweeteners and other factors like that. Has that been part of your journey as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, there's the whole obesity issue with, um, and sugar being the, the, the big culprit there. So mm -hmm. focus on reducing sugar as sugar intake in the, in the, in the consumer base. Um, there's to some of our territories, we actually have a sugar tax. We, we're now being taxed on the sugar content in, the, in our products. So yes, very much a health focus. Um, moving away from the traditional carbonated soft drink, more yeah. into the juices and the waters and more yeah. the hydration side of the, of, of the business. So yes, uh, definitely been a, mo a move to that. And uh, yeah, we're seeing that. And that's, as I say, there's a lot of players in that field. There's more water brands than I think any of us can mention <laughs> at the moment. Well, and two, you mentioned package sizes. I mean, um, I've been fortunate to, well, I don't know, fortunate, but I've traveled around a lot in uh, in my role here. And uh, going to different countries, you see Coca-Cola delivered in so many different pack sizes. You know, we're used to the two liter bottles and, you know, 12 ounce cans and stuff like that in the U.S. But even then, you, you see varieties now, these thinner cans, smaller cans, all sorts of things. So the packaging dimension, even though it's the same flavor, starts to create some complexity as well, right? Absolutely. Quite right. I mean, if we look at a number of years ago, Coca-Cola came in a 300 milliliter, what was that, a 12 ounce bottle, I think? Yeah, yeah. Eight, eight ounce or 12 ounce, I don't quite know the US measures, but a 300 milliliter glass bottle. Now that same Coke comes in, what's it, six different packs? Yeah. And yeah. That's just on a on a on an average day. So yes, very much back proliferation is is rampant. So you had mentioned um, the challenge, you know. So if we start to take these market conditions and and then shift and look at how they impact you from a supply chain planning, you know, the one comment you made was just try to forecast all of that stuff. So talk a little bit about what you've seen in the complexity of the forecasting activities. <sighs> <laughs> it's <laughs> didn't mean to step on a sore subject but yeah that's a, that's a, that is a sore subject um we and not just we i mean business as a whole i mean it's we're spending a lot of money time effort resources into getting the forecast better and whenever things aren't working the first thing is we need to get a better forecast and mm -hmm. we went down the same road and we spent a lot of money and we buy the software and we train the people and we do all the good things. And really at the end of the day, the needle doesn't move that much. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's some improvement, but it really doesn't. And every time we launch something new, it's just adds to the complexity. So instead of having the pie consist of 10 slices, now all of a sudden that same pie is 20 yeah. to 25 slices and the slices are just getting smaller. Yeah. So yeah. it becomes more and more difficult to, to forecast those niche products. As I say, brand coke, easy to forecast. If everything mm -hmm. was brand coke, no problem. Yeah. You can run it on MRP, you can feed it in the one end, you can be pretty sure that the result coming out of the other end is going to give you what you need. Reality is we don't have that luxury anymore. Yeah. So we need to find a different way of doing business mm -hmm. without having to rely so heavily on that forecast. Yeah. Well, and then obviously there's an impact with these additional SKUs in terms of manufacturing complexity. I mean, I'm assuming that, well, I know that from your environment, not all the bottling lines can run all the sizes of your different packs, right? So you've got to create additional production capacity based on the different product packaging uh, varieties that you choose to follow. Is that correct? That is correct. And not only getting additional bottling lines in place, but then saying some of the existing bottling lines, let's take a PET line, a plastic line, and that traditionally we would manufacture a two-liter product on it. 
Mm-hmm. Now, all of a sudden, because of the proliferation, now we want to do a 2.2 liter, we want to do a 1.5, we want to do a 1.25. Oh boy. And now we're putting all of that on the same line. So where we had 100% capacity to two liter, now all of a sudden that capacity is sliced up into sharing it between the different packs that we run off the same line. Yeah. So it's not only putting additional lines in, I mean, putting a dedicated, if I had a line for every pack, life would be pretty simple. Yeah. The reality yeah. is I, I don't. I have a line that does, and some of our lines do up to 20, 30 SKUs on, on one line. Sure. So now you've got to try and juggle 30 SKUs into a 24 hour day. Well, and that yeah, and, and, and obviously they're not going to all have the same rate of consumption in the market. You're going to have some fast movers and then you're going to have some slower running items. So some of those you probably don't want to run on the same frequency, right? You're, you're probably because of batch Absolutely. consideration setups and things like that have to fold them into the schedule uh, over time where it makes sense so that yeah, you're not absolutely. just running too small of a batch because it's got a low level of demand. Is that correct? Absolutely. And, and also we have minimum batch sizes. I mean, you can't run less than a, a certain minimum. Mm-hmm. And that for some of the SKUs could result in two or three months worth of stock. Yeah. So you you kind of, kind of plan that very carefully. When do you run it? And also then when you run it and then considering the shelf life issues because all our products have a shelf life. Yeah, and our shelf lives have shortened with PET versus glass. We've got a longer shelf life in glass products, so all these things just add to the complexity. You got to some things you want to run every day because the volumes are just so big, and you want to get fresh product out there. So you want to try and get a couple of hours a day turning out your fast runner. But then once every six weeks, you want to run that one small pack, and then you have to try and run a minimum run on that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, there's a lot of fun in that. Um, how do you folks deal with uh, new product introductions? So, you you know, you talked about the fact that you've got niche products entering the market. You you respond, whether it's through your own innovation or uh, something that Coke proper uh, introduces into the market. Um, how do you deal with the, the challenge of trying to estimate what the new consumption will be for new items coming in? You're using some kind of forecast, but what's your experience been on that in terms of how accurate those forecasts are? I would I would think you've got some winners and losers in that environment. Absolutely. Now you you're quite right. I mean, some products surprise us. This case in point, I'm in Kenya at the moment. We launched Energy, a, a brand called Predator, and it absolutely has taken off beyond mm-hmm. all expectation. But like hundreds of percent more than what we anticipated. And then at the same time, we'll launch a Fanta Zero or Fanta No Sugar. And we're expecting it to give us a similar kind of volume than the original f- formulation did. And it just mm-hmm. dies in the market. It just yeah. goes yeah. nowhere. So it's a bit of, I don't want to call it a gamble, but it sometimes feels <laughs> like a bit of a gamble. Well, no, it's part of the reality. I mean, it's, <laughs> You know, you, you go on your best judgments and you, I'm sure you do market research and other things like that. But at the end of the day, it's the customer that's really deciding to buy. Um, one other dimension around forecasting that we've seen with other clients in this space is um, because of the item count and the skew proliferation is that they try to forecast, I'll call it at a category level, like, you know, certain like juice products, they'll forecast those, but the mix within them can become a bit more hard to discern, right? And what, what's the philosophy that you folks follow in terms of category management, category forecasting, or are you trying to get it down to the item level? We're trying to get it down to the item level. We, we really trying to get it down to at least a, a pack level. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then basically then just, disaggregating it into a, into a flavor split yep. and getting it into the biggest or the smallest sensible bucket. And mm-hmm. that would generally be a monthly bucket and then just disaggregate into the weeks and days if need be. But as everybody knows on, on forecasting, I mean, the bigger the bucket, the higher the level, the more accurate it is and the, more, the easier it is to forecast. Yeah. So it always helps to be able to forecast at a category level for a year. Yeah. But the reality is our supply chain doesn't work like that. 
uh, supply <laughs> chain works in different flavors, in different yeah. packs, and in days. I'm, so, a, yes. I'm a loyal Coke consumer, but I don't buy categories. I, I know exactly what I want. Exactly. And so I'm after the item, you know, and, and that I think is part of the challenge here is how do you deal with the volume of information you're trying to work with, get reasonably accurate forecasts, but at the same time recognizing that it's the consumption at the item level, you know, the flavor in the pack size yeah. at the right point place in the market that that really makes the difference in terms of how effective your uh, supply chain is operating. No, absolutely. And, and to your earlier point, I mean, with the proliferation of new innovations and new, new products out there, each one of those products comes with its own set of raw materials and packaging materials. Yep. Yeah. So for every one product that's launched, it's, it comes with five or six raw materials. Yep. So all of a sudden, you've got this multiplier of times five right. at that level. And a lot of them are unique. There's some shared materials that you can share across, but many yeah. of them are unique. Like a preform like and stuff like that would be shared, but shared, but a label is unique. Label yeah, is exactly. only one flavor, one pack size. So yeah. those kind of things just add to the complexity. How do you forecast because you need the forecast to get that raw material down to that level of granularity. So absolutely. Yeah. And I've I've seen other clients where they've got a challenge because there's changes in the recipe, if you will, or the formula for the product. So the ingredients are changing. So now they have to re-spin up a, a new label to make sure that the content in the beverage is, or the product is the same as what the label on the package is indicating. So Absolutely that can be quite is. a challenge. Mm -hmm. So obviously this is quite interesting and quite challenging. Um, you've got a lot more product competition out in the market, new entrants coming in all the time. We've seen that in the US market as well, seen it in beer, we've seen it in soft drinks, seen it in juices. It, it's really kind of in every corner of the, uh, the marketplace. Um, you're doing your own innovations. You're introducing new products, some of which take off and do extremely well. Others that may struggle to find their place in the market. Um, you found that forecasting can be, you know, more reliable in certain segments, but less reliable in others. And so a lot of knock-on effects that actually get then into the operation of your supply chain, right? So just to give people a little bit of a context of the operation that you're responsible for in Greater Africa, just talk a little bit about like the number of production sites and locations that you're working with and kind of what, the, what does that network look like uh, from a high level? Okay, so the, the region that I look after is, as I say, it's, it's the CCPA footprint within Africa with the exception of South Africa. So in the region that I look after, we've got approximately 31 production sites, which equates to about 90, just short of 100 um, beverage lines. And there's about 50 odd non-beverage lines. So it's your backward and forward integration. So this is manufacturing our own preforms, manufacturing our own closures, manufacturing sh shrink wrap and stretch wrap. Mm. And then a bit of the forward integration is the um, recycling. So we've got some equipment that we're doing plastic recycling with. So there's about 50 out of these machines in, in the, within the group. And then just on the actual physical network, then there's over and above the production site, there's about 48 distribution depots and strategic supply partners in, this, yeah. in the network. It, it's quite an interesting range of countries that you're working in. Uh, obviously, we've been delighted to support you in that regard. Some of the most exotic sounding city names and country names is anywhere on the planet. So it's uh, very, very cool to uh, to see the growth that you've experienced. Um, now, a few years ago, you had started getting interested in demand-driven MRP as a concept. And, um, you know, kind of give us the backstory on that. I know we had the opportunity for you to kind of share that journey earlier uh, a few years ago with our audience. But uh, many new companies are reaching out to us. So it'd be interesting for them, I think, if you would just talk about how you got interested in DDMRP, what problems you thought it would solve, and what the journey forward from there had been like. Right. Um, so where did, where did this start? Uh, it started with a lot of frustration. Um, not getting better at working with working harder. So we were kind of we reached a, a bit of a ceiling. I mean, our big KPIs that we measure from a, specifically from a planning perspective is out of stock. 
do you have stock available? And then the on time and full delivery. So customer service, so everything customer facing. And those two metrics were kind of deteriorating over time with the proliferation of all the new SKUs and everything that was happening. And I was really trying to find how do we, how do, we do this better? Because just beating the forecast kind of didn't do it. So mm -hmm. that was part of the problem. And I was messing around with some fixed bin models and min max models and just looking at different ways of doing it. That's when, uh, when was it? It was around about the end of 2015. I saw something about DDMRP. And I thought, mm -hmm. what, what's this all about? So read a little article about it and I thought, okay, that's interesting. And then 2016 really st started getting involved in learning more about it. And that was a, a couple of years journey. I think it started off at the SAPEX uh, conference in Cape Town. I attended one or two of the presentations. Started, okay, hang on, this is, this is something that I can kind of get my head around. And this is something that sounds like it's dealing with the problems that I'm facing. And then yeah, from there, we basically took it on and piloted it in 2017 on a little homegrown Excel model. So we wrote a little Excel model for ourselves to kind of size the buffers and do the math and all that. And we piloted it in a single site. And just to see, mm -hmm. is, it, is, is this the answer we're looking for? And well, in retrospect, not surprisingly, it actually did give us a benefit. <laughs> and then we tried to uh, roll it out to one or two more. So, okay, well, was this pilot site a, a unique situation? And then we launched it into two or three other sites and realized, hang on, this thing actually is giving us what we're looking for. And basically what we were looking for is how do we reduce our out of stocks? How do we increase our on-time info? And how do we optimize our inventory holding? Because mm. it's it's easy enough to reduce out of stock and increase your uh, your on time in full just by having mountains of stock lying around everywhere, and obviously that was not not an option. There's working capital constraints. We we can't afford just to have stock everywhere, and we also don't have space to have stock everywhere. So yes, so we went through a whole cycle of training. What's that? 2017, 2018, and then into 2019, and that's when we approached you, DD Tech, and when we basically then started our rollout in 2019 of the of the formal DDMRP software. Yeah. And that's a bit of a background on where we came from now. And so against the, I think you mentioned out of stock and uh, the OTIF numbers, um, you know, what were you able to see a rebound in those kind of performance levels? Can you just share some anecdotes on kind of what, as you started getting a wider deployment of DDMRP, um, Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so the, the, the benefits we saw was quite remarkable and kind of very short term and kind of once off. So we immediately saw an improvement in out of stock. I mean, we were running in double digit out of stock percentages. We immediately within months brought that down to single digits. Mm -hmm. And over the years now, we're, we're down to below 3% type numbers. Yeah. Um, on time in full. I mean, we were hovering around the 80% mark, which for, for us moving consumer goods, everybody out there would know that's, that's horrendous. That's really not acceptable. And all of a sudden, we're up into the mid 90%. So we saw a real quick improvement in that. And the surprising thing for me was at the time, we saw no improvement in the forecast accuracy. Yeah. So I could... That was the evidence that I needed, that I didn't need a better forecast to get better results. I needed a better way of doing business to get better results. Yeah. And that's what DDMRP did for me. Awesome. Awesome. Um, if you look at the, the lessons learned from that journey, and obviously we're proud to be part of that story, but what would you share in terms of kind of key lessons learned, takeaways that uh, would be important for others considering going down the path? <sighs> Training. Know what DDMRP is. Understand the philosophy and the principles of DDMRP and is it relevant to your business? Because I don't think DDMRP is necessarily the, the silver bullet for everybody. I don't think it's, even yep. within our business, we're now finding a couple of years down the road that it's not necessarily the right 
answer for all our SKUs. We maybe yep. want to look at some things differently. And that's something that we'll be addressing, I think, a little bit later on. We're going to be talking a bit more about that as well. Is training, understand it, and get the organization on board. with. It's a very different way of thinking to the traditional forecast-driven MRP. Mm-hmm. And there's a, there's a subtle language difference. Where we're talking about, we, we don't refer to the forecast in the, in the operational term. The forecast is important, but it's important in the tactical and the strategic horizon. We not, don't talk about it in the operational horizon. We don't talk about safety stock. We don't talk about day's cover. Day's cover is a result of something else. And you need to get that language and that thinking in the organization. Because if you don't, you're always meeting with resistance. Because there's a lot of institutional knowledge from many, 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 many years that said, well, we always used to do it this way. Yeah. And this is the way we're going to do it. And to get that mindset change is, is, is probably the, the, the biggest challenge. And not surprisingly, I suppose, but right at this most senior level. Yeah. We need to get the most senior guys on board with the thinking, get them sold on the principle, and then it actually becomes very intuitive. It becomes obvious to the point where you think, why have we not done this before? Yeah, it's interesting because the conventional MRP logic, start with your demand and we can backwards schedule what you need to buy, manufacture, package and distribute to meet that demand. Sounds so clear and logical, but it's obviously based on some incredibly flawed assumptions. One is that the forecast is accurate. Second is that there will be no variation on that journey. And that's not the reality that we've been facing, obviously. And I think that that's, that you make some great points here. It's just help people understand there's a different way to skin the cat, if you will. You know, there's a different approach, the benefit of which is that you're using a more concrete, more reliable, more accurate demand signal to start the process. And by doing that, that's where you're getting the better alignment of material to where the market needs are, reducing your out of stocks, reducing your, uh, improving your OTIF numbers and the like. Awesome. As you go forward, um, obviously a lot of ground covered, but you know we can't rest on our laurels and we need to continue moving forward. What are kind of some of the additional goals that you've got in mind for the organization as you go forward from the supply chain planning and operation standpoint? So basically what we, we've had, DDMRP implements it as our planning tool and philosophy within the Great Africa group of companies now for What's it? Three coming on four years in June. Coming on yeah. four years, three and a half, four years. Yep. So it's now time to say, well, we kind of got the basics down. Now we need to start utilizing more of what's available. So really starting to focus more on the SNOP side of it. Really starting to focus more on the future side of it. What does that look like? How do we use the tools and the principles to start streamlining or redefining what our SNOP looks like? Mm-hmm. So that's a big one. Um, another big one for me is just general user capability because uh, we've got a lot of users that know the basics, but have never really dabbled in the, a bit more of the, I'd like to call it the more exciting stuff, mm-hmm. the, the new innovations that's in the software, the things that we can do that we actually, we don't know what we don't know type thing. So getting that on board. And then my big challenge for, for this year is onboarding new people, needing to, needing to find a way that we get new people up to speed in the shortest possible time. Yeah, absolutely. I don't, I, I, I don't want to spend a lot of effort or time on teaching them the basics. I rather want to get spend that time on how do we exploit it further? How do we really get the planners doing planning, managing by exception, looking at the outliers, managing the, ex- the, the, the crises on a day, not... Yep. worrying about the routine stuff. And then obviously having said that is then automating a lot of the routine stuff. Awesome. Getting the getting the routine decisions made by the system. Double check if needed, but not having a, a person actually having to make every single decision on every single purchase order or works order that is raised. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's do this because I want to share some perspectives here um, that I think will help illustrate how some of these elements that we've talked about uh, kind of relate to the supply chain realities. Let me see if I can get my screen pulled up here. And these are observations that I've pulled from a range of different um, food and beverage clients that we've worked with. 
they're kind of similar to what you might see in other industries, but it's kind of a way to bring to light kind of the, the realities of what you've just dis discussed. This is a view of finished items for a given uh, manufacturer um, and their cumulative daily usage. So I wanted to build a Pareto chart. I think these Pareto charts are incredibly instructive in trying to sort through problems and challenges that are out there. And we can see the cumulative rate of usage here. And we go further out onto the end here where we've got roughly 150 SKUs. You can see there's almost no increase in the last half of the SKUs that are in the, in the kit. And obviously what that means is that there are slower runners. There, it's an example of the proliferation that some of those are not going to be running at the rate of a, you know, two liter you know, standard Coke kind of pack, if if that was the reference here. And it kind of helps understand that, boy, this starts to change a lot because, yeah, excuse me. Um, as we look at the left side here, there's a lot of bread and butter kind of products in this range. Then as we get further and further out, those are the ones that maybe are the slower movers, the new entrants that haven't found their market yet, things like that. And this basic paradigm has an influence on a number of other dimensions in our business. So have you seen kind of uh, an example of this in your environment? Is this kind of characterized to a degree, maybe the slope is a bit different, um, kind of the challenges that you folks have faced? You could have used add data for this. So yeah. it's, it's the yeah. same thing, yeah. So, so let's take that and let's think about some of the challenges that you talked about. You talked about inaccurate forecasts. We didn't spend a lot of time on variation, but I think it's something we can illustrate here because part of how DDMRP I think is more effective is that instead of worrying about the forecast, it understands how to address variation in a better way. And the more effective we can control var variation, whether it's demand or supply, we put ourselves in a different place. Um, we talked a little bit about those slow movers and how they fold into your production schedules and, and what does that represent? And then obviously that has also, if we're running a batch less frequently, it's going to have an impact on inventory turnover rates, which while you, you've you kind of moved some of the focus away from day supply, it's yet today still a predominant measurement that people are focusing on. So this is an example, and this is kind of a hard chart to see, and I don't know how well it's going to come across on the web, but this is a comparison of forecast to actual demand. And uh, the actual demand are the blue bars. The forecasted demand is in red. And you can see there's points here, right here, where they're not aligned, <laughs> you know, where the, the one is much higher than the other or vice versa. Uh, so we converted that into, and this was a fast moving product, one of the, probably the, this company's uh, steadiest runners, if you will. But if you look at it in terms of the forecast actual variation, and this plots that up and down, if I see, uh, that it's a positive number, it means that the forecast, that the, the actual demand came in greater than the forecast. If it's a downward movement, it means that the actual demand came in far less. And you can see there's quite a bias here in terms of upwards and downwards movement. More often, if I'm going to see a, a, a variance downwards, it's going to be well below what the forecast was. Uh, we tend not to overachieve the forecast very often. I think most companies would say that their forecasts tend to be a bit more optimistic than the actual market demand. And you can see that there's quite a bit of variation between these two. And then if we contrast that and look at a slow mover, we kind of see a similar picture. Sometimes we're pretty close to our forecast and other times we are far apart, right? And my contention has been, and I think this is what you've kind of illustrated is as we get into more proliferation, new products, they're not entering at the same rate of demand. They haven't yet found their market we're dealing with these slower moving items that um, may take a while to settle in. And the likelihood is that there is gonna be a fair degree of variation here between what we expect to happen and what actually happens. And we'll show kind of that, that view here as well. In this case, on the slower mover, the height of the overachievements are were actually greater than on the fast mover. And the downward strokes were about the same, but there was more of them. What you see is that there are very few weeks where we are basically on the money, you know, in terms of forecast. And I don't know if other uh, folks in the audience here are seeing or analyzing this kind of information, but as we've looked and worked with different clients around the world in this space, you know, we see that there's this challenge. And I think this is part of why the DDMRP or the demand-driven philosophies make sense. Any comments here on this, Barry? 
No, I can only agree with this. This is, yes, absolutely. Some are better, some are worse, and unfortunately, more than half of them are on the worse side. Yeah, on the short side, which leads to overstocking and, and other issues as well. You know, obviously, we didn't talk a lot about shelf life here, but with the, with the market focus around freshness, I see a lot of companies that are really trying to keep the inventory turnover rates high. Therefore, they're keeping the product as fresh as possible in the market because it tastes better and it's, it's a better uh, way to manage. So let's look at this. And we're, this chart is a little bit, um, um, let me see if I can move this zoom control a bit so I can get it out of my way. Um, this is looking at the levels of variation. So now, as we look at items that are moving slower, this is again, the cumulative daily usage value, kind of similar to that first chart. And we've plotted against it what the coefficient of variation is. Variation is a critical dimension that we're trying to manage in DDMRP. And you see that there is a trend. The items that have slower rates of demand tend to have more variation to them. It's not as compelling as some might expect, because you even see in some of the heavier runners here, some examples, let me get my pointer going here if I can. Oops, no, I'm not gonna bother. There we go. Um, if I look at these two SKUs, these are pretty heavy runners. They're obviously on the left side of the Pareto chart. They're, they're showing pretty sizable demand, but they also are experiencing fairly strong variation. And this could be an example like that, uh, I think you called a predator drink that came out in Kenya and all of a sudden it hits the market, it's running hot, but it's you know got volatility in its demand signal. This is important to us though, because as we understand this, we have to recognize that as we get into categories of items that have more variation, especially if we're trying to protect our on-time and full rates, trying to service the market better, that we need to make sure that our buffer settings are gonna give us the right kind of support uh, to enable that kind of service level that we're driving to. Uh, we took a similar look and looked at batch size. And this goes back to the comment, I'd want your, your input on this one. This looks at the average batch size in terms of how many days of supply does it represent? In other words, we run a batch of say, 10,000 units, that's going to be equivalent to 30 day supply or 60 day supply, something like that, because that's an indication too of our uh, of our shelf life kind of considerations. And you can see a very high correlation here where, you know, for the most part, the items in this client's portfolio were being planned with longer intervals between their batch runs for the slower moving items. Um, and that obviously presents some planning and operational challenges in terms of how do you phase those in in a coordinated way. Is this kind of reflective of your environment? Any comments here? No, absolutely. I mean, smaller batches predominantly beneficial. It's yeah from many things, not just from a freshness perspective and a shelf life perspective, just from a storage perspective. I mean, if I can replenish it every other day or every two days. I don't need the same kind of storage space in my warehouse to actually stack right. all the stuff. Yep. So there's there's a lot of working capital consideration is I'm carrying less tied up money in, in my inventory by smaller batches. So definitely I agree with you. Yeah. The reality is though that we do have the, the, the slower runners and that a, a batch is just by its very nature 30 days worth of stock. So. How, from a portfolio management, and when you think about um, product proliferation and things like that, do you work through the business to then try to use these kind of insights to help rein in perhaps maybe some products that are not running, don't operationally make sense? Um, maybe there's different sourcing strategies you might involve. Any comments there? At this stage, we don't we don't really make the decision based on a, on a supply perspective. So we still very much if it's if it's if the customer wants it, we'll make a plan to get it. Mm -hmm. We will look at to your point maybe a different way of getting it, but we won't necessarily rein it in purely on a on a supply perspective. It will predominantly be on a on a demand perspective. So if the demand's really dropped off, we're not getting the return on on on, on the product that we're expecting. That will then, and then obviously, if there's a 
three or four or five or however many of these products in that bucket, then we'll start saying, okay, well, which of these are really difficult to run? Which of these are really just tying up capacity and money and not giving us, and then those will be the first that we will basically yeah. put on the short list to be cold. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, this is interesting too. And cause this kind of is, goes back to what you were saying. This takes that same view of a Pareto chart, looks at the SKUs and then looks at what their average days on hand is over the past year for this client. So you can see here are steady runners down at the left side here. The ones that are moving quack quick are running in the neighborhood of, you know, 20 day supply, you know, which would be something in the neighborhood of 15 turns a year or thereabouts. And then on the other end, the slower movers are, are really up at a level that's probably in the 40-ish to, to 50 or 60 days of supply on hand on average, just because of the very point you're making. You know, It's got a batch size that requires that to make it economically reasonable given setup times and other factors like that. We know the inventory is going to hang around longer. Obviously, the more we can avoid that, the more we can uh, improve our inventory turnover rates. Comments here. Yeah. No, absolutely agreed. It's as I say for us. I think the, the very left hand side, depending on the market, I mean, it, it actually goes down low. It goes down sometimes below ten days, yeah. between five and ten days. So we can actually, and those are the, the nice ones. Those are the ones that really in and out, quick and easy. And then on the other end, yes, yeah, our right hand side looks pretty much like your graph does. Yes. Yep. Okay. So I just want to take a little bit of a detour now. And for those of you on, in the audience who've not really been exposed to DDMRP or really had much focus on that, just talk a little bit about what is the elements of DDMRP? How do they differentiate? This is not uh, a certification class by any means. It's just going to be a real quick flyby to give you an idea of the core principles. And then uh, we'll have time for a, a little bit of Q&A here before we wrap up. So if we really look at the MRP as a concept, it's based on the following logic. You know, Tell me what the forecast is, what your demand is that you need to satisfy. And it will inform us based, words, based on backward scheduling, what we need to buy, what we need to produce or manufacture, what we need to package and distribute to meet the demand. And we know that that's based on a couple critical assumptions. First, that the demand or the forecast is accurate. And we can all have our debates and question that and challenge that. But I think suffice to say, pretty much everybody accepts that forecast accuracy is always going to be a problem because especially with more products, there's more things to, as you said, you're slicing the pie up into smaller bits. It's going to get harder and harder. Um, we also assume that there's not going to be any variation. We know that's not the reality. And then also the final assumption is that your item master data is accurate. And I, I don't think any software system can help you if you don't at least have the basic data accurate. So with that, you know, if there's tactics that we can deploy to improve on the demand signal, to better manage variation, then we arguably will be in a better position. And that's where this whole philosophy of moving to DDMRP is so different. The reason people follow the forecast is that the customer, when they issue an order, are not going to wait. You know, they want it shipped the next day or the next two days, and all of the dependent activities that have to happen to make that shipment, go buy this stuff, go make it, go package it and distribute it to meet that demand, take far longer than the customer is willing to wait. So customer tolerance time, as we describe it, is far shorter than our lead time. So if I try to get to a consumption-driven model, the way DDMRP is built, I have to do something different to ensure that the stock will be available. And the whole principle there is what's called a DDMRP buffer. And it's built to ensure constant availability. The idea there is if it's constantly available, then I can utilize the most accurate signal. If I start with a more accurate signal, then arguably I should be able to get to a better place. The yellow zone in the, oops, the, excuse me. The yellow zone in the DDMRP buffer is sized to cover my usage over the lead time. So when I issue an order at top of yellow, the material should arrive at bottom of yellow. We all know that that's not always gonna happen. So we build a red zone I size to address variation, items with high variation, maybe some of those slow movers that have more fickle demand patterns, you'll have a heavier red zone to cover them to ensure you've got that constant availability because you know you want to be able to pace to the actual demand. Steadier runners, the red zone as a, as a size relative to the rate of demand will be smaller because we know that the demands are more predictable. 
And then obviously we have to have our batch sizes. And this is where our green zones come in because that's where we order up to. We order from top of yellow to top of green. So our green zones should reflect our minimum batch sizes or minimum order quantities or the order cycle that we want to maintain. If we're only going to run this product once every month, you know, let's say we'll use a 28 day cycle and that way it will come up on a repetitive basis around that 28th day window so that we can fold it into our production schedule along with the other demands that we've got for the heavier running items. By doing this, we establish this constant availability and the buffers are flexing dynamically. We have changed the paradigm from being dependent on a forecast to building a buffer or a stock position adequately sized to meet the range of demand patterns that we see. When we do this, we gain the huge advantage of having the most reliable demand signal driving our planning process. That's accomplished through something that's called the net flow equation, which is taking our on-hand inventory, adding to it the supply orders that are about to do to uh, arrive, and it uh, come, uh, taking away from that, sales orders due today or in the past, this would be for finished goods, because we want to wait as long as possible to take an action because things that we tie to the future inherently have some risk and variation to them. Although we will include future demand spikes that look big enough that if we did not plan for them might jeopardize the constant availability of that buffer. When we do that, then our inventory will hover typically between the low end of the yellow zone or middle of the yellow zone, dipping into the red zone on occasion. And what you'll see is in very frequently this sawtooth pattern emerge where we've got a reliable planning signal telling us when to generate resupply orders and an inventory level that's predictable, manageable, and within the ranges that we expect to be able to support uh, going forward. So the, the whole application of this and how we connect the dots now to the story you've told Barry around F&B where we've got skew proliferation, new niche products, competitors coming out of the woodwork, uh, challenges and folding the new introductions that we ourselves make with uh, our operating schedules, improving our out of stock levels, improving our on time and full levels, you know, and getting better leverage of our working capital is really what we plan to cover in our next webinar, which will then take these ideas that we've talked about in today's session and apply them down at a more detailed level to give you all an illustration. So uh, as I was mentioning, we're gonna run a follow on webinar on uh, March 15th uh, at the same time at 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, that's just uh, two weeks away, where we're gonna take and show the application of demand-driven tactics and technology to bring to light, how do we address some of the chronic challenges that folks in the F&B space are encountering? Um, so with that, uh, let's see if we have any questions uh, in from the audience. Are there any questions out there? I'm gonna stop my share. Okay, I've got one. Um, here's a question. Did you overstock on spare parts because of long and uncertain lead times? Did you update your MRP planning parameters because of that? Um, Barry, any any comments? We're, you're not really dealing with spare parts, but uh, where have you had issues with overstocking and what were some of the conditions around that? Um, yes, to your point, we um, spare parts does not form part of our, our planning portfolio. Um, but yes, we definitely did have in specifically around our raw materials. Um, so we had certain raw materials where the MRP, because it was forecast driven and specifically around the new introductions, which are very volatile and generally aren't as optimistic as anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, we ended up with a lot of overstocking and then obviously obsolescence and write offs. That's this cost yep. us money years. Yep. Um, if you look at your experience with your, you know, working capital and your inventory levels, you mentioned that you kind of were able to see improvements pretty quickly. Have you been able to sustain those um, over the coming years? Yes. So the, 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 the improvement was quick and to a level. So the, the incremental improvements are, are relatively small, small step, but, but we had a really big jump initially. Yep. And that's just 
kind of maintaining those levels and slight improvement. Yes. Yeah. There are certain laws of gravity <laughs> you know, that yes. we can't overcome, but uh, the good news is that you're able to sustain it. I know a lot of clients that we've talked to there, they, they put a heavy focus, maybe at your end, they try to squeeze inventory down, but then it rebounds right back after the end of the year and the annual report is, a, is published. Um, next question. Um, in terms of types of products that you implemented DDMRP for in your proof of concept in that piloting stage, was it kind of the full range? Did you just select certain categories, anything along those lines as a way of getting started? What we did is we took one of our smaller regions, we took, we, we, we piloted in Namibia. And Namibia is a relatively confined small market. And we did it with across the cross range, all, all finished products and all raw materials. And, and the reason for that was we wanted to see, does it work across the range? And the, the sample was relatively small considering the size of the market. So yes, we did a, a kind of all-inclusive pilot. Yep. Um, another question that we had asked was, um, what were kind of the stories from a pandemic standpoint? The, you know, were there any unique challenges how did the application of DDMRP during those periods play out? Um, just share some of your observations around, especially in the early days of the pandemic. I think you had a, you kind of narrowed your focus to a certain range of core products and things like that, given the challenges from an operational yeah. standpoint. Exactly. So yes, first thing, okay. First thing is nobody planned for a pandemic. <laughs> So I don't care how good your planning systems are. I, I, I've yet to meet anybody that actually planned for the, 20, for, for the year 2020. So yes, that kind of came as a surprise to all of us. Then with the full lockdown, to your point, yes, then we kind of prioritized certain packs and mm -hmm. just focused on those. We didn't go, we kind of dropped the full range and just focused on certain key SKUs. And then obviously, as everybody knows, there was all the issues that went with that, um, transport issues, um, yeah, lockdowns across the, across the globe, not just local. So yes, lead times just spiraled completely out of control. Um, variability just went through the roof. And yes, and in all honesty, no matter how well we had sized our buffers, we still ran into trouble. It was just, I mean, no yeah. buffer was built for what happened in 2020. So yes, we, 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 we kind of took the pain in 2020 and then started planning around it. Changed the master data, increased the lead times, increased the minimum order quantities. So when we get stuff, take a bit more, cover yourself. And we still, I mean, it's, yeah. we're, we're in Africa. I mean, COVID is, more or less over in most of the world, but we still feel the, the, the kind of the, the ripples yeah. in, in, in the markets that we deal with. So yes, it's, it, it's, it's not over yet. And um, yeah, you know, we just beefed it up to, to accommodate those. So yes. there you go. Um, here's a question. Um, in terms of uh, your use of DDMRP, are you using trailing uh, in other words, ADU or blended or forward looking, what's, what's been your um, kind of guidance around the usage of uh, the different daily usage types? That for us very much depends on the time of year. Um, so we've got a two very distinct peaks, one very big peak over Christmas, uh, being Africa, our summer season and Christmas kind of falls in the same month mm -hmm. and our school holidays and our academic years kind of end in December and start again in end of January. So it's kind of Africa on holiday, summer and Christmas. So it's a, it's a, it's a really big peak compared to the rest of the year. So as you're building towards the peak, we will genuinely look at an FDU because the trading consumption just doesn't reflect anywhere near what the future looks like. So we will change it to an FDU. Directly yep. after a peak, we will probably also keep an FDU just to get us out of the, the higher buffers quicker. So we can reduce the buffer sizes quicker to get back to some sense of normalcy. And then during the, our off-peak period, we'll look at a trailing ADU. So then we'll yep. look back. Yep. So basically, the, the direction I give the team is 
if your future looks pretty much like the past and rather use a trading um, consumption because that's more accurate than a forecast of your consumption. Yep. Yep. And again, planning using a forecasted rate of demand is different than planning to the forecast. So it's, yep. it's helpful to ramp the buffers up for those peak season periods really doesn't require much in the way of adjustments and makes it much, much easier. And I think that also connects back to your idea of trying to make the planning environment as reliable and stable so that the users can really focus on those exceptions and the other kind of conditions that a, an individual needs to get directly involved in. Yeah. Well, Barry, thank you so much for your time. I'm sorry, but we've reached kind of the end of our hour. I want to appreciate all of those who've uh, joined us today. Uh, the link to the um, sign up for the second session in a couple of weeks is in the chat window. So you all should have seen that. We'd love to have you come back and join us uh, for that next session. And we'll get into more of the how to's and the operational elements. But Barry, your comments around the industry context, I think we're right on the money. I mean, I think it's a very interesting and compelling arena that you folks are uh, competing in. You've obviously done very, very well. Uh, congratulations on all that success. And again, thanks for being such a great client to work with. And uh, we look forward to continuing that relationship. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, it's been a privilege to be here and privilege working with you. And thank you. And good luck to all everybody right. else who's considering DDMRP. So thanks, everyone. Uh, Y'all have a good day and we'll be in touch. Uh, thanks so much and best wishes on your demand-driven journey. Bye-bye.